Well, Orsted is having a very bad month or so. A uh, number of problems going on there. Uh, they have their stock has dropped uh, the most ever, about twenty, a little over twenty percent. Uh, do some, some problems, mostly in the United States, uh, supply chain challenges on projects like Ocean Wind 1, Sunrise Wind, Revolution Wind, and having deliveries for uh, monopiles is a, evidently is a problem. There's a delayed. There are so many things happening with Orsted at the moment, Bill, and a lot of this it seems to be things that are out of their control. Supply chain issues, Interest rates, also investment tax credits, are not coming out to what they thought they would be. And so uh, Mads Nipper, the CEO of Orsted, in a call, and when, you're, when this podcast comes out, it's been a couple of days ago, uh, he was not happy. Uh, and they are considering abandoning future projects uh, in the U.S. because the profitability criteria is not being met. And they do plan to finish up the projects they signed up to in the Northeast of the United States because they have sunk costs. And I'm not, not sure that makes sense, but we'll, I think Orsted will finish those projects. Uh, but they're looking at uh, a financial impact of a little over $2 billion for the, these three wind projects that are happening in, in the United States. Bill, I, I, when all this went down earlier today, the news reporting was insane. Uh, everybody was trying to figure out what happened to Orsted because uh, as a company that is so knowledgeable in wind period and renewable energy, uh, they have really hit a real impasse in the United States. Indeed. And as you've indicated, um, you know, Mads Nipper came out and said, these are things that are unfortunately largely out of their control. They need the supply chain to meet their contractual obligations in terms of component delivery. Um, that's contributing a little over, you know, or has the potential to contribute a little over 700 million um, in impairments uh, if they don't get back on track. Um, they're already delaying uh, one of those three projects uh, to 2026 now. Um, I believe it's the uh, the ocean wind is now uh, not slated to uh, to come online until 2026 as a result, and you're you're seeing you know as you've also indicated this in investment tax credit, um, which is is slightly interesting and odd because you know the rules. With this uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the rules for the production tax credit and the investment tax credit were never quite precisely finalized. Um, and we're still technically waiting for official um, uh, Internal Revenue Service confirmation about what the the qualification criteria are going to be. And what it's looking like at this point is that Orsted's suggesting that perhaps the investment tax credit's not going to be as lucrative as it would have been uh, for them. The other challenge to that is they're not going to be able to take advantage of a lot of the domestic content um, production uh, benefits that come from the production tax credit side of it. Uh, particularly because we don't have the necessary investment in um, the uh, the blades, the nacelle, the, the monopile and jacket foundation fabrication and manufacturing capabilities here in the United States to be able to support uh, even the projects that are that are being worked on right now. We're still having to source a lot of those components from Europe um, and potentially from Asia, but mostly Europe. And bring them over and and install them. Uh, so this is also potentially what's contributing to those supply chain issues. But um, you know, th all of those things coupled with this high interest rate environment that we still find ourselves in, where you know, I mean, look, inflation still exists, but it's been mostly dealt with, and yet the U.S. Federal Reserve also insists on continuing to send signals to the market that they want to continue raising interest rates albeit modestly but um you know this is in this is a a combination or what uh mad snipper from from Orsted referred to as a perfect storm of uh 
issues that have created an unfriendly environment for investment in offshore wind in the United States at this point. And and that's going to be not only a challenge for Orsted, but frankly, a challenge for everybody. Well, what is what is the follow up in the short term here? You know, Orsted financially, these projects, these offshore projects in the in the U.S. have an impact on their cap table. Like the valuation of Orsted is dropping at a remarkable rate over the last year or so. It has dropped a, a good amount, uh, enough to be worrisome. And I think investors are starting to get a little bit. Uh, worried about the future. Now, obviously, Orsted is uh, backed by Denmark and, and is a big driver in the Danish economy somewhat. Uh, Nova Nordisk sound like they're taking over that top role because of some of the pharmaceuticals that are happening up in Denmark. But in, in terms of just the business outlook and what they do next, I, I don't think Matt Snipper is wrong about this. I just don't know what he's going to do about it. The challenge here is these are things that are out of their control, largely. Um, you know, you're you're seeing a situation where, you know, yes, they can, you know, threaten certain things to the supply chain, but ultimately they are dependent on the supply chain to be able to deliver the components, um, you know, on the contractually ob obligated schedule. You know, once... Um, the contracts have been signed, and once uh, you know the final investment decision or FID is is uh, decided upon, that triggers a certain schedule of dates that everybody that's involved in the project has to be able to abide by. And if the supply chain is still going to be stung by you know high input costs, either again inflation related or um, the availability of materials or what have you, you know, the, the supply chain obviously has its own set of profitability issues, but it's starting to spill down, um, into, you know, the, the project developers and, and, uh, the rest of the, um, kind of value chain in, involved in both onshore wind, offshore wind, solar, et cetera. Um, so this is, this is going to continue to be a, a challenge. You know, I was asked um, a similar question earlier today, um, what can be done? And at the end of the day, this is all now kind of in the hands of the U.S. Federal Reserve. I mean, that's the one knob that can be turned here that will start having a material impact on a lot of these issues. If we can start lowering interest rates, it's going to unlock uh, a lot more investor uh, money and it's going to unlock a lot more capex investments in the fabrication facilities as well that are needed in the United States to be able to handle um, you know the the manufacturing and fabrication of of components domestically for these projects that will in turn start um, you know easing pressure on um, the supply chain companies. Um, you know, input costs, uh, lower interest rates will will have a material impact on, um, you know, lowering uh, their input costs, which will then also again contribute to lower capex on on a project. Um, you know, lower interest rates also mean you know lower cost of money, um, and the potential to be able to get back to uh, the power purchase contract prices that you know, were originally being agreed upon, and now companies are, are trying to pull out of uh, of those power purchase contracts. So these are the, this is the one knob that I think can be turned is, is starting to lower interest rates. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a huge waterfall, but, um, you know, if you're, if you're going to continue as the Federal Reserve indicating that you're going to increase interest rates in an environment where everybody's already you know, backed out of a lot of the investments or trying to back out of a lot of the investments that they were committed to. Uh, this is not going to, this is going to delay the, the, the takeoff of the industry until, you know, well into 2025 or 2026. We're, we're at least seeing, you know, this, this is a setback that's already uh, impacting us by a good six to nine months uh, from now. You know, it'll probably be about the middle of next year before you see anybody diving back in whole hog in the U.S. offshore wind market. 
Do you think that we'll have to see a difference in the way the contracts are written going forward? Because I remember a little while ago, we talked about some negotiation with an offshore wind developer that was um, being asked to guarantee a certain output of energy. And we discussed how you'd be crazy to to guarantee, to write a contract like that, that um, locked you into something that you had no control over because you can't control how much wind there is in a year. So your contract can you know, unless you're an, an idiot, you would write your contract so that it said you have, you know, other performance metrics that you can control rather than, you know, something that relies on mother nature. Um, in the past, maybe people thought that supply chain costs and interest rates and tax credits were something that could be, you know, accurately predicted ahead of time. We're saying it's not just the wind industry that has this problem. We have, it sounds really familiar to me, like the same reason why the building industry in Australia is um, having a lot of problems because there were so many fixed price contracts and the price went up and everyone just went out of business in, in response. They just couldn't, you know, they, they could not deliver on those contracts. Um, so yeah, obviously these projects at an offshore wind farm is a bit more of a big deal if that gets cancelled compared to if somebody's home doesn't get built at the, um, you know, the price that was agreed. But, you know, moving forward, aren't we crazy to say I'm going to take all of the risk for supply chains, interest rates and everything on the, you know, on the developer's side? Shouldn't they be writing into their contracts that it has the price, final price has something to do with where those um, those, you know, those indicators go in the future. But don't we have Avant Grid as a good example there where they got pressured into low PPAs and everything went up and they, they essentially walked away. Orsa's not saying they're going to walk away, but I think here's the interesting company that hasn't said anything yet, Equinor. What is Equinor doing in the middle of this? Now that they see uh, Orsa having trouble and Avant Grid walking away, Equinor is being really quiet. Empire Wind, not hearing a lot about what are they doing? Are, are they taking a different avenue? I know they're really tied to New York, and, and that's a particular problem on its own. But there's not a lot of players in this market space, and two of the big ones are having really strong financial difficulty right now. Yeah, well, isn't the difference, um, you know, who's got diversification beyond this, um, you know, one, one market with these problems? Equinor's got all, you know. They're laughing all the way to the bank with all of their oil and gas money sitting there. It must be a blip to them um, and a yeah, perfect opportunity to, you know, wear a few losses and take the whole market. And in a couple of years, they're the only ones with any experience building offshore wind farms. So are the only winners in offshore wind the oil and gas companies? That's a great question. And I think long term, it may be the case where they are the majority owner or investor in a lot of the projects it's it's hard for pure play wind company to to do offshore wind project development that is so capital intensive um and in a market environment that makes it you know like like Rosemary just said, I mean, they nobody else can get the requisite experience to and obviously Orsted's plenty of experience with what they've done in Europe and, and Taiwan, etc. But they it, there's still specific things that are unique to each market. I mean, you see Brazil uh looking to build up, you know, they they have the second biggest pipeline now in terms of proposed projects in the world behind China. Um, you know, you're you're at a point where you know, in in any other market, uh, you know, you're you're not necessarily going to have the opportunity to gain the experience if you're not able to play in the market, and if deep pockets are the only thing that are is going to ensure that you can play in the market, then it it basically does come down to sovereign wealth funds and or you know the oil and gas companies you know, that may have a sovereign wealth fund behind them, like, uh, you know, Equinor or, um, you know, perhaps some Saudi companies that will end up partnering with somebody uh, that that has some offshore wind development experience. But it's it's interesting because that is something that that could occur out of out of all of this is uh, and, and also potentially answers the question, why did some of these major oil and gas companies like BP and Equinor 
um, bid so much for the lease rights in places like New York um, and and the Northeast of the United States. Uh, it's because they understand fundamentally the value of having these offshore lease rights. Um, so yeah, it's uh, that's that's kind of an interesting notion at uh, at this point. Uh, I I think it's challenging. I, I hate to get all conspiratorial here, but you kind of wonder. No one, no one in the administration is 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 batting an eye at this. This is happening uh, a week after they announce a billion dollars going to carbon capture, and where's the DOE? Nothing. Eversource left the marketplace uh, weeks ago, right? Uh, so the Americans are abandoning in this re relatively quickly. I don't know what they have left, and I haven't heard any sort of leadership from the DOE or uh, Boehm or anybody say, hey, this is a problem when you get on this thing. Nothing. It's been complete radio silence. I won't suggest conspiracy theories per se, but there definitely is – there's a – you know, I was asked earlier today whether or not I think the U.S. offshore wind market is in a crisis. And I have to agree with that sentiment that this is a short-term crisis that we are facing. And we're – the industry is the only one that's kind of bearing the brunt of it. Every, like you said, I mean, the administration is just kind of shrugging their shoulders. Like, we're saying, hey, we're we're in a crisis here, guys. And, and they're still off running tenders for, you know, the Gulf of Mexico. 